Hello, everyone. It's 9 p.m. in Hong Kong, 1 p.m. in London, and 9 a.m. right here in New York City. Welcome to this live global conversation about the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Sri Srinivasan. I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at the Stony Brook School of Journalism. I'm honored to moderate this conversation brought to you by the University of Hong Kong. This is part of a series for all of us to learn lessons from what's happening in Hong Kong and in the rest of Asia. Last week, we spoke to Provost Richard Wong about the economic aspects of the crisis. Today, we're discussing lessons from Asia about masks, vaccines, and other preventative measures. We have the perfect guest for this topic. Professor K. Y. Yun, who graduated from the University of Hong Kong in 1981 and heads the Department of Microbiology, has a rare distinction of being a microbiologist, surgeon, and physician. Widely known among specialists in infectious diseases, Professor Yen made his mark in 2003 when the outbreak of SARS gripped the globe. He played a key role in the discovery of the agent causing SARS, the SARS coronavirus, thus leading to measures that were crucial to containing this outbreak of the disease. He has also led the team in the discovery of other disease agents, including the novel human coronavirus HKU1, the bat SARS coronavirus, and many other bacteria named after Hong Kong or China. He published the first Lancet paper on the familial cluster of COVID-19 pneumonia, indicating person-to-person -person trans transmission. Please welcome our professor and guest, K.Y. Yun. How are you, sir? I'm fine. Uh, hello, Sri, and uh, to everybody, and uh, Kobe KY. Thank you for making time for this event. How are you feeling? How are you doing? I'm feeling fine. I still was not infected by the virus yet. I'm so grateful. For three months. Yeah, so we're very grateful for that. Uh, thank you. It's a long day already. It's 9 p.m. in Hong Kong. We're taking questions from around the world via the hashtag HK, ask HKU Med. Ask HKU Med, hashtag HKU COVID-19, or leave your comments on the Facebook Live HKU 100, or email fightcovid19 at hku.hk. Fightcovid19 at hku.hk. Professor, you just published an article on the controversy over the face masks. COVID-19 epidemic disentangling the re-emerging controversy about medical face masks from a medical perspective. So let's talk about that right now. This is the article you published. And there were three questions in the article. One, can infected individuals reduce the risk of spreading the virus to others by wearing face masks? Well, that is very certain. Basically, the, when you wear a surgical mask, even if you are shedding viruses, many of those uh, virus particle laden uh, uh, droplets cannot escape through the mask. So basically, actually, the most important function of wearing a surgical mask is that uh, even for asymptomatically infected individual, or what we call subclinical mildly symptomatic individual, uh, they may be shedding viruses uh, unknowingly. And by wearing a surgical mask, this would markedly reduce the amount of infected respiratory droplets or saliva being shedded from this patient or from this subclinically infected patient to infect other people and also to infect the surrounding. Uh, you know that when the saliva and droplets come out, they often drop within the three to six feet away from the patient. And that uh, will lead to uh, indirect or direct uh, transmission, uh, especially when the other people unknowingly touch such secretions. And we know that this coronavirus can survive on surfaces for many days. And that is perhaps one other important route of transmission besides uh, directly spraying people with the virus uh, through coughing and sneezing. So basically, I must say that uh, wearing a mask protect other people, uh, even if that person is already infected. And of course, when you are wearing a mask, while you are susceptible and not infected, that also protects you to some extent. 
Thank you, uh, Professor. For everyone watching, we're having this global conversation with this great expert. Here's your chance to ask a question, to participate. Tell us where you're watching from. Post your comments and ask your questions. We are so honored to have this opportunity to have a global conversation where we can have a back and forth with Professor Yen, who is a microbiologist and an expert on infectious diseases. The second question in your article that you just wrote was about can uninfected people reduce the risk of infection by wearing face masks? Yes, of course, because uh, we know that this uh, surgical mask uh, cannot be penetrated by secretions. It has a layer on the surface which is watery patterns. So any respiratory droplets spray onto the mask will be uh, stopped. And the second, of course, is that it has filtration function. It can filter away particles that are larger than 10 micrometer. We know that it cannot filter very small particles, those less than 5 micrometer or 1 micrometer in diameter. But we also know that most of the time, it is more likely that the larger droplets that contain more virus, that is actually harmful to individual. We know that there is what they call inoculum effect. That means that more many a time, one virus particle is not sufficient to cause an infection. It may take 40 to 200 viral particles uh, that come into your uh, nose, mouth, or eye mucosa. I mean, the surface lining of your respiratory tract. And that would be sufficient to cause an infection. And, and that's why the, these larger particles, uh, what we call respiratory droplets, uh, that contain more viral particles are likely to get you infected. So wearing a surgical mask also protect yourself from uh, getting infection. But of course, one very important point that I just mentioned is that even if you have no symptoms, you may already be infected. And then of course, by wearing a mask, you are stopping yourself become dangerous uh, to other people, especially in your family or in your workplace. And so in Hong Kong, under the situation where our population density is very high, our working space or living space is very small. We are talking about every people occupying only around 60 square feet or 120 square feet in our home. Uh, wearing a mask is very important in the workplace and even sometimes inside home uh, if you have any respiratory symptoms. Thank you, Professor. We have one more question that came from your article that you addressed, a really important piece that you uh, wrote in the journal. Can widespread use of face masks in a population facilitate the control of an epidemic? Especially in the situation of Hong Kong, we believe that uh, universal wearing of masks is very important. Uh, remember that in Hong Kong, uh, our population density is high, our space is small, and we have a high uh, epidemic pressure because around 50,000 Hong Kong people cross the border every day. And that bring in viruses from mainland or overseas, depending on the situation. And that's why, because we know that there is a large number of patients who are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. So everybody wearing a mask will stop those asymptomatically or already symptomatically uh, infected individuals from shedding the virus into the environment or sprayed on the other people. While at the same time, those who are uh, susceptible, not yet infected, would protect themselves from getting infected. So this measure of wearing a mask appear to be very effective, at least in our population. And remember that wearing a mask itself is a symbol of civility in Hong Kong. Uh, people, you really wear a mask, people feel that you are very uh, responsible, very conscientious. And while at the same time, by wearing a mask, it actually deter us, uh, actually remind us not to touch our nose, eye, and face. And uh, of course, it will need some training because people did uh, occasionally uh, touch their mask uh, from time to time because of some uh, itchiness or irritation uh, on their face. But with some training, uh, most people would be able to wear a mask correctly. A correct use of surgical masks is very important uh, to ensure that 
there is not much leakage around the mask so that the air that we inspire are being filtered. And um, of course, uh, when everybody, I mean, when many people are wearing it, uh, people uh, would uh, be in somehow be induced to wearing it uh, by the showing people that they are also very conscientious about personal hygiene. Thank you, Professor. We have people watching around the world right now. We want to pull up some of the comments uh, where people are right now, where they're sharing. So please, all of you who are watching, comment in the, the Facebook or the Twitter stream that you're in. Uh, we just want to bring here a comment. Uh, Therese Steiner says, bonjour from Yonkers. That's right outside New York. Thank you, Professor, for sharing your knowledge and experience with us. On a practical note, what is the reason for what is the reason for recommending, or what is the good resource, sorry, for uh, teaching us how to wear face masks at home. And maybe we can also show the two masks again, side by side, so that there is less confusion about them. There is a surgical mask and an N95 mask. So if you can talk about those and, uh, and, and then a good resource, I know that our, the website that Hong Kong University has on fightcovid19.hku.hk has addressed this multiple times, but let's show the masks again. So if you see on the left-hand side are the surgical masks. It has a layer of water repellent uh, material on the surface. And then in the middle, there are um, materials that have filtration function. And on the side that is close to your face is a layer of uh, water absorption uh, uh, material that would uh, decrease the amount of moisture uh, that comes from your breath and also the mouth. This kind of surgical mask is able to filter larger particles that are more than five to 10 microns in diameter. Uh, of course, there are some degree of leakage even if you try to seal it around the face. Uh, so this kind of surgical mask is generally used uh, under condition where there is little risk of airborne infection. Now on the right side, you can see these are what we call the N95. Now these are highly efficient masks in filtering even small virus particles or droplet uh, or what we call aerosol particles of size less than five, five micrometer or even those which are less than one micrometer with uh, high efficiency. Now this mask uh, have to be tested first before you wear it. Uh, we call it the fit test, so that you use the size of a mask or the shape of a mask that really fits your face, so that the amount of leakage around your face is less than 5%. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, N95, ma N95 mask uh, is uh, lacking in many localities in the world because everybody wants to use such a uh, high level of protection. But uh, it has, we have to remember that, uh, especially in the healthcare settings, especially in intensive care units, the accident emergency department, and especially during medical procedures such as bronchoscopy, you put in an endoscope inside your airway, and that may induce coughing by the patient, or in the case of emergency intubation, or you are in a ward full of patients with COVID-19 infection, when the air may contain a large number of virus particles, then you really need an N95 mask to protect yourself. But in other situations, in general, in general ward where the risk of contacting uh, COVID-19 patient is low, a surgical mask is sufficient. And similarly, in the Hong Kong setting, in the community, a surgical mask is generally sufficient for our protection uh, to ourselves or uh, to other people by wearing these surgical masks. Thank you, doctor. There are so many great comments coming in from all over the world. People are watching right now. If you're watching, please hit share so that your friends and family can watch this. If you're watching a recording, that's also okay. Tag a friend. There's certainly somebody in your life who would benefit from this. In fact, everybody would benefit from these comments that are coming in from Dr. Yen. So please do tag and share this as widely as you can. It's really important that people get this life-saving advice as one of our commenters just said from Professor Yen of Hong Kong University. So let's get into some of the questions. We're also taking questions via Twitter. And uh, Kathy Lee says, 
Uh, you give hope. Uh, everyone will follow the advice. Wearing masks is a must. That's what uh, one of our uh, our uh, viewers is saying. But we have a good question from NYXTWTR on Twitter. Ask HKU Med is the hashtag. Why do the majority of Western countries still refuse to wear masks in community settings? Their excuses vary from incorrect usage of masks, face touching, shortage for healthcare workers, and lack of data. They're claiming that the success in Asia is due to other measures. So please talk a little bit about the medical and the cultural differences that have resulted in this divide. And we know that in America, it looks like the CDC is going to be much more uh, coming out in support of masks. Well, the first thing is that I do not want to be dogmatic. In fact, uh, there are a lot of scientific research going on uh, trying to address this question where the wearing of surgical masks are really useful for protection in a community setting. But I must say that the bitter experience of SARS in Hong Kong in the year 2003 has taught us a lot of lessons. Uh, the first thing is that uh, we in Hong Kong are really very densely populated. We are, our office, our home, everywhere, even in public uh, places, is very crowded. And it would be very important, very difficult for us to do very e effective social distancing. In fact, uh, most of the time, you can't really separate yourself uh, from other people by six feet. And as a result, even in the year 2003, a lot of people are masking themselves in order to protect themselves from getting SARS in that particular year. And uh, of course, uh, we also have to learn from past experience uh, with other acute respiratory virus infection, and especially the, uh, from influenza. If you read the literature on influenza, especially those systematic analysis, it shows that surgical masks do have an effect even in a community setting. Of course, it has effect in the healthcare setting, but even in community setting, we all know now that uh, wearing a mask did reduce uh, the risk of getting infection in either a community or in a university setting. And if, especially that after you uh, stop using a mask and just do hand washing, the effect of protection is markedly decreased. And so uh, in Hong Kong, this is not a difficult uh, uh, I must say it's easy to ask people to wear a mask. But in a Western setting, it's quite different because wearing a mask is a sign that you must be ill. So, so people tend to refuse the use of mask. But I think at the present situation where the pandemic is uh, galloping, I do think that especially uh, in the urban setting where there are a lot of people uh, coming together, it is really important to have everybody getting a surgical mask to protect yourself and to protect others. And uh, I do think that the changing of this, the ch the changing stance of the US CDC is a wise way to go. And uh, I do believe that uh, not just in crowded places, but uh, even in less crowded places, when you contact people, when you have a very high density of infection in community, uh, surgical masks do help. Thank you. And uh, we just see a headline at CNBC. It says, in a U-turn, U.S. Surgeon General asks CDC to see if face masks can prevent coronavirus spread after all. We've had some other headlines that we'd like to show you where people have been saying in the Western press now, they're talking about opportunities to think more about masks. So there seems to be a slowly evolving discussion. Here's an article. Uh, that uh, CNN Asia may have been right about coronavirus and face masks and the rest of the world is coming around. That's a James Griffiths piece. Let's see some more of these. Uh, we have the New York Times saying more Americans should probably wear masks for protection. So there's more of these are coming. Uh, the discussion is evolving as you can see around these, whether people should wear masks or not. So we really appreciate your point of view on this. We also have people commenting right now and emphasizing the value of what you are sharing. We also have a tweet that's come in uh, at AskHKUMed, hashtag HKUMed, AskHKUMed. Please make sure you're using that hashtag. Should masks be used by seemingly healthy people? This is 
where you were already saying that in places like Hong Kong and Japan and others, healthy people wear masks often. And in America, when you see someone wearing a mask, you presume they're unhealthy. I, I still think that masks should be used by seemingly healthy people in highly endemic area. When you have a major uh, outbreak of infection due to this uh, new coronavirus, uh, and we also know that many of those people infected are asymptomatic or very mildly symptomatic. Now, so if you use universal masking, you are stopping those mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic individual from shedding the virus into the environment and also spraying on other people when they uh, involuntarily uh, take deep breath or coughing or sneezing. So I still think that masks should be used by seemingly healthy people in the present circumstances in all the countries where the epidemic is raging. Thank you. Let's, let's take a look at some of the uh, really good comments that have been coming in. We have more than 1,200 people around the world watching right now. Please tag your friends, please share. Sky says, good morning from the Upper West Side. Great info and thank you, Professor. Uh, you are at nighttime in Hong Kong. We're early morning here in New York. We're just getting used to uh, the morning and the routines here, but you've been in, you know, you're ahead of us, not just in time now, but also in the cycle of the disease. So if you can talk a little bit about that, that would be helpful. Uh, Diane says, hello from New Jersey, life-saving information. And what and with what materials are the best ways to make your own mask? So if you can talk a little bit about, is it okay to make your own mask? And then also, what are the other lessons we can learn? And after masks, we'll also get to vaccines. And we know people have a lot of questions about vaccines as well. So keep posting your questions, hashtag ask HKU Med ask HKU Med, or in Facebook, you can write the questions. We have so many questions and comments coming in. So over to you, Professor. Of course, it is best if you can buy or procure surgical masks which are made of, uh, with standard uh, uh, function, uh, including breathability, filtration, and water repellent functions. So uh, these are standard uh, masks that uh, we medical uh, profession are uh, using all the time. But if you really can't uh, buy these uh, standard ma surgical masks, then you really have to make it. And remember, even cloth masks, although they are not uh, having a high uh, efficiency of filtration of these particles by 90%, uh, they still have uh, something like 50 to 70% filtration function. And uh, in general, thick the thicker the cloth, the better the filtration function. And the important thing is that when you make such mask, you must make sure that it really seals off your nose and mouth uh, so that when you, the air that you breathe in are really being filtered. It is still better to have a less efficient mask than to have no mask at all. Uh, but also remember that uh, wearing a mask is not all that is necessary to prevent infection. The second most important thing is to have uh, good hand hygiene. And the hand washing is very important if you have the washing facility. But many a time, especially when you are outside your home, it is difficult to get uh, washing facilities. And it is always important to carry a pocket-sized alcohol in hand rub. So this is 70% 70, 70 alcohol. And inside, there is also glycerol, which is a wetting agent to ensure that their hands, the skin of your hands are not over dehydrated. It is the WHO formula that is advocated by uh, experts in infection control. And uh, I always carry it all the time. After I touch something, uh, especially I want to touch my eye, nose or mouth, I would use this uh, alcoholic hand rub to ensure that any virus particles on my hands are all disinfected. Thank you. And uh, I like that you are so organized and uh, ready and resourceful for uh, for yourself, but also for the community. That's the part that I think Americans are starting to understand that you're going into isolation and doing these measures, including hand washing, not for yourself, but for your community. 
and for everybody around you. We have lots of great questions and comments coming up. Let's pull some of them up on screen. I saw that Jane Perry said, thank you so much, Professor, for your work and so many great comments from all over uh, the world. So please share this right now. Uh, tag a friend. There's somebody who's watching right now, live or recording, who would benefit from this wonderful advice and information. Harriet says, Professor Yun is doing great job for mankind. Wow, isn't that nice? Promoting universal use of masks would save a lot of lives worldwide. So let me ask you this, Professor, in terms of now that you've heard that the American Surgeon General is also recommending this, uh, looking at corona masks, why do you think that there is less appreciation for this in America versus the rest of the world? I still think that uh, the insufficiency, I mean, the lack of masks is a big issue because when government officials uh, advocate to use a mask, while they cannot really provide it, that makes life very difficult and difficult for them to make the recommendation. But while at the same time, you must understand that if it is really protecting people and uh, especially healthcare workers that is well known to everybody in the field of infection control, the bearing surgical masks would protect uh, healthcare workers from acute respiratory virus infection such as influenza. And then at the same time, you tell people that uh, wearing a mask is not going to protect you in the community. That doesn't make a lot of sense. And that actually is a confusing message to the public. Uh, I, I think that is one very important lesson that we must learn, that we have to tell people the complete truth uh, rather than the, uh, uh, trying to talk something uh, which appears confusing and uh, because of another reason, which is availability. So we have to honestly say that uh, this is not yet available for everybody and that um, we have to provide all these surgical masks to healthcare workers first, and that is perhaps uh, an important lesson that we would have to uh, learn after all this confusion. We have a very good question here from Dr. Nav Paul at Dr. N Nav Paul, who says, with the PPE shortages that's happening, personal protective equipment shortages around the world, what is the best advice with regards to surgical respirator, or, or respirator mask rationing, especially for healthcare personnel. So if you can talk a little bit about that. Well, uh, in Hong Kong, for example, the, we have been thinking about uh, the lack of N95 respirator mask, uh, because that is the most uh, deficient sort of items at this stage in time. And of, uh, now we are trying to uh, do a lot of experiments to show that the use of hydrogen peroxide vapor to, re -disin to disinfect the mask after use. And uh, we now know that uh, basically this can be done. And these uh, N95 respirator masks can be used uh, many times uh, afterwards. And we, of course, label all these masks to make sure that they are sent to the same person again after disinfection. Uh, so, uh, of course, um, we have to be innovative because shortages uh, cannot be met with uh, within a short period of time. Uh, we are now even thinking about uh, using ozonizer to disinfect a surgical mask. And uh, one of the things that I was doing actually is to wear a reusable cloth mask inside. So one layer inside and then wear the surgical mask outside. And after use, I use the ozonizer to ozonize it and then hang it up and let all the ozone uh, disappear. And then I use it again, but again with a reusable cloth mask inside and then uh, disinfected, an uh, ozone disinfected uh, surgical mask outside. Uh, besides using ozone, the other thing that we can use is to use UV uh, light. Uh, we have UV boxes, ultraviolet boxes that can be used for surface disinfection of these surgical masks. And I do think that we have to innovate it. All these masks would not suddenly fall from the sky. And so, um, I'm sure that other people will have other innovative ways of uh, reusing the mask in a safe way. Thank you. We have, my phone is lighting up because there are questions from all over the world on WhatsApp and all these other things, Twitter. Please folks, ask a question with hashtag AskHKUMed, hashtag AskHKUMed, and please do follow HKUMed for great content throughout the year. 
Uh, one of my friends just asked, what are the precautions to take when you're going into a supermarket, when you have to leave the house, you're told stay at home, but you have to go shopping. So can you walk through that? And we also have a question from a doctor watching in London right now, asking how long do these particles, these virus survive on different kinds of materials? Well, we know that the virus is quite hardy. So depending on the type of surface is drop on to, uh, if it is a metallic plastic surface, uh, it can survive a long time, uh, talking about five to seven days at least. Mm -hmm. And then if you fall on the other the linen material or cloth, it survives a shorter period of time. Basically, it's always the ambient temperature. It means in cold environment, it survives longer. Humid environment, it also survives longer. Dry surfaces, uh, usually is much, especially with absorbance property, it survives shorter. Uh, when you walk through, uh, you want to go to the supermarket with a lot of people, always wear a mask correctly. And always remember to bring your alcohol and ram hand rub uh, so that uh, you disinfect your hands after touching something. And especially the first thing when you arrive home is to wash your hands. Very important. And of course, uh, when you go back to your office, uh, if you're uh, in Hong Kong, because the, although it's still the, in early spring, uh, we always try to open all the windows so that the air change is sufficient. Uh, remember, in the in, in the hospital ward setting, it is around six air change per hour. But once you open up the window, it's always above 20 air change per hour. And if there's some wind, it's over 100 air change per hour. So that even if there are a number of people inside, uh, the uh, any infected droplets which is being coughed out will be carried away very rapidly. But I still, uh, in Hong Kong situation especially, <clears throat> where the uh, epidemic is, is still with us, I always wear a mask when I see any people in my office, even with the window open. Thank you, uh, Professor. We're about halfway through our conversation with Professor K.Y. Yun, who is the chair of the Infectious Diseases Department at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, we are so grateful that you're with us please follow at HKU Med. Please ask questions with the hashtag AskHKUMed and tag a friend right now. We're having a global conversation, a chance to learn about masks and vaccines and all these other important parts of this particular crisis that we're having right now. Uh, we have a question from Wan, Wan Ho Pun who says, what makes this virus so deadly and so contagious and is it constantly mutating is the question that has come in. Uh, firstly, the virus uh, is more deadly than the seasonal influenza, uh, definitely. But it is less deadly than the 2003 SARS coronavirus. And there are a lot of reasons behind that. Uh, it all depends on the genetic makeup, the proteins that this virus is producing. Uh, we know that there are proteins that is produced by this virus that antagonize our uh, defense mechanism. We have a defense mechanism called what we call the innate immune response, and especially producing a substance called interferon uh, from the cells, which will stop the virus from uh, uh, functioning. But this virus also produces some proteins that antagonize this interferon system, and that allow the virus to reproduce inside the cells. So from one, mid, one viruses that enter the cells to become billions of virus, uh, which are released uh, in the respiratory uh, organs, say, for example, in our lung. And of course, uh, once you have a lot of viruses in the lung, uh, they produce, it induces inflammation. And with inflammation, the lung are clogged with fluid. And that's why you can't breathe and you may, may die from it. But remember that most people are able to fight this virus effectively. Uh, unfortunately, for the elderly people and those with underlying medical illness, uh, their immune system, especially the innate immune system, especially involving the interferon, uh, may not be that effective. And that's why the amount of virus continue to increase. And as time goes by, they go into respiratory failure. And then the, around the 10 to 20 percent of these elderly patients of with comorbidity, they finally succumb from this infection. Uh, uh, thank you, Professor. Gladys Kim says, 
Thank you, Professor Yen. Save Hong Kong and save the world. You are the light of HK. So uh, somebody really uh, admiring your work, uh, Professor. Thank you for what you're doing. And uh, Young C. Ming says, thank you, Professor Yen, for your hard work and insightful sharing and your honest, outspoken approach. When you hear these comments like this, uh, how does it make you feel? And how do you uh, think that it reflects on how people are looking at other leaders and the information they're getting at this time? Uh, thank you for all these kind comments. Uh, I just try to do my job well at the age of 63. I just want to do everything that I can for, for Hong Kong and uh, of course for the world. Uh, but at the same time, I must emphasize again that uh, it's not just surgical mask or respiratory mask. It's also important to remember good hand hygiene, hand washing, alcohol headache, hand rub, it's very important. And then social distancing, you try to keep people uh, away from around six uh, tiles on the floor. So that is around six feet. You try to improve the ventilation of your room. And of course, you try to avoid overcrowded places. All these measures are very important. And uh, of course, you must be conscientious. Uh, if you really develop a cough and sneezing, uh, and you, you go test, get tested. If you can't get tested to know whether you are being infected, you must try to stay home and don't go outside to infect other people. Uh, to be good citizen is very important at the time of a pandemic. Uh, if we, everybody is doing the part, I'm sure that this epidemic will slowly die down, at least for some time uh, before the vaccines are available. Remember that vaccines is still at least one and a half year away uh, because uh, doing vaccine is not easy. Uh, you have to have the vaccine seeds and then you have to do a lot of animal experiments to make sure that the vaccine is safe for the animal and that it really induces uh, all this in, uh, correct immune response in the animals. And then finally, you use uh, what we call virus challenge to the immunized animals or vaccinated animals and see whether your vaccine is really useful and protective. And that takes a long time. Then we have to go to the human trial after we successfully use on three different kinds of animals. Uh, and again, the, uh, for what we call the phase one clinical trial, we have to show the safety of the vaccine. And then we have to go further uh, to look at the immune responses in a, in a large, larger number of individuals. And finally, we have to enroll a high number of people to see really whether the vaccine is really safe and really protective. So it really takes some, quite some time. Before the vaccine is available, everybody must do the job. Wearing surgical mask correctly, do good hand hygiene, maintain social distancing, uh, and that is a good citizen. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have a uh, we're going to talk a lot more about vaccines. So, folks, if you're watching right now, please tag your friends. Please hit share or retweet so that more people can join this conversation live or recorded. Uh, we are talking to Professor K.Y. Yun, who is the chair of infectious diseases at Hong Kong University Medicine. And please follow at HKU Med and ask tweets with hashtag ask HKU Med. So let's go to a question from Tracy Chan in Europe. She says, many people are looking forward to the end of a lockdown in a few weeks. Do you think wearing masks should be made mandatory by authorities if they start relaxing the measures? That is a very good question. I do think that it is better for the health ministers and health authorities to educate people to wear a mask. Uh, instead of uh, asking for mandatory uh, wearing a mask, uh, it is be always better to convince people and train them to wear a mask first, uh, instead of using draconian measures or forcing people to wear a mask. And uh, before that happens, you ha need to have a few weeks of uh, a lot of advertising, a lot of uh, uh, persuasion in media uh, so that people know that they should wear a mask. And then when you stop the lockdown, the mask would be able to mean actually the function, one of the important functions of masks is actually, is a form of social distancing. Uh, by filtering the air that comes out from any individuals or being uh, 
inhaled by any individuals. Uh, so in a way, when you stop a lockdown, you are increasing, uh, you are decreasing the social distancing. But by wearing a mask, you are actually uh, increasing the social distancing in terms of the sharing of the, our breath. All right. So by this filtration of our breath, the air that is being exhaled from anyone on while the other inhale some air which is being exhaled by another individual we are actually separating them in some way so i, I do think that education persuasion is more important for mandatory uh, or legal measures uh, in uh, trying to uh, make this possible thank you professor Dr. Yuan, we want to point out you're also a surgeon and a physician and a professor. You've just done so much. And by the way, you said you were 63. You look like 43 and have better hair than I do. So that's amazing. Right. <laughs> uh, we want to show you, Professor, the kind of global map of where we are at the moment. And we have this map that we're looking at. Uh, from an American point of view, it's unusual for us to see America uh, on the side of where it is right now on the extreme right, as you can see it. But Please reflect on these numbers as we look at it. What will it mean if we hit a million confirmed cases, which we are most likely to? What will it mean when we hit 100,000? Is the world ready for this? Are there certain countries that can bend the curve, flatten the curve better than others? So just reflect on this map, sir, if you could. Well, I do think that um, if everybody is conscientious, Say, for example, in Hong Kong, 98% of the people wear a mask when they go out of home. Uh, despite that Hong Kong is so overcrowded and so many the people coming all over the world and many people cross the border, we're still able to maintain a relatively low number of cases per population. So I do think that uh, it is possible for anywhere in the world to control, at least uh, mitigate, the present epidemic situation and of course countries with the largest amount of resources should be able to do it faster if they are really convinced that all these measures like wearing such a mask uh, hand hygiene social distancing etc are being uh, practiced by all citizens but i'm really afraid that if the infection is raging in africa or south america uh, which in in these places where most are uh, what we call for developing countries, then they really have a problem. They really have a hard time uh, because uh, many of the people there were died until the, the infection spread across uh, the population until the herd immunity uh, reaches around 60 to 70 percent, uh, which means that uh, if you are talking about 60 to 70 percent of population being infected and around well, one to four percent died this is a huge number and that especially affect those who are elderly or those with underlying medical illness. That is a huge number. This is actually a calamity uh, for the developing countries. But at this stage in time, uh, I must say that uh, the developed countries who have the best resources to stop the epidemic first themselves and while at the same time trying to make vaccines and antivirals uh, as rapidly uh, as possible to make them available and then try to help the developing countries in their fight against this uh, new emerging uh, coronavirus. Thank you, Professor. We have so many questions and so many comments coming in. So I'm going to make the question short and we'll just keep moving so we can get through as many of these as possible. Here's a question that came in from Phantom Delight. What a great Twitter handle, Phantom, Phantom underscore Delight. It says, what is the one thing you would want the US to do in the next three days to limit what's ahead in the next two weeks, two months, two years? What is one thing you could, if you could talk to President Trump, what would you want America to do now? Well, I, I think the most important thing is to take the epidemic seriously. Uh, the number would rocket if uh, things are not being done uh, decisively. And I do think that uh, the message to the public in terms of personal protection is still not yet sufficient. Every American should be told about how to do proper personal protection. Uh, in order that uh, all these uh, messages about the uh, surgical mask, uh, hand hygiene, 
social distancing are really clearly related to them. And uh, of course, uh, we must be conscientious if you are young, healthy individual, you get any respiratory symptoms or even a light, uh, very slight degree of fever, you must stay home, wear a mask, uh, try to distance yourselves from your family members. You try to eat alone, you stay inside your room until you are much better. Usually after seven to 10 days, the viral load in your respiratory secretion goes down. When we check our saliva, our patient's saliva who are suffering from COVID-19, the number of viral particles per milliliter of uh, saliva goes up to around 100 million uh, in terms of genome copy. That is a huge number. Our secretions, if we are infected, our secretions is laden with a huge number of viral particles. And these viral particles can survive in the environment for quite a long time in terms of many days. And so if we are not serious about this situation, it is very difficult to control this epidemic. So only, uh, my only word is take it really serious. It is not something light. Uh, although you are young and healthy, uh, you must think for your family members. There are always elderly in your community. There are always people with uh, uh, underlying medical illness. So uh, you think about others, not just yourself. And that is a very important message for the control of this pandemic. Thank you. Very clear instructions from you, Professor. Thank you. Folks, we have about 15 minutes left and lots of questions coming in. And I just want to understand that number again you mentioned, Professor. You said 100 million parts per, mil, uh, per milliliter of fluid, right? That's what you're seeing in the saliva of a million viral, 100 million virus particle, most likely. So it's yeah. a so that's very high. Copy every cubic centimeter of saliva very high. So how does that compare to SARS, for example, or influenza, if you have those numbers? Um, the number is just comparable in influenza or other situations. Okay. Uh, remember, uh, this virus survived longer than influenza in the environment. Yeah, then that's, that's the scary part. Uh, here's a question from a young man who's watching. Jason says, I'm a Form 4 student. That's a high school student in Hong Kong, right, in your uh, part of the world. When do you think schools will resume? Are there any measures schools should adopt when school resumes? Yes, uh, that is, uh, again, a very good question. In general, un unless all the uh, officers, I mean, the community, the uh, workers, all the office resumed, uh, schools will not resume yet. Say, for example, in Hong Kong, although the office, office work are resumed for quite some time uh, previously, the schools are not uh, being resumed. And that is especially important for primary schools and also kindergarten, where students are uh, difficult to maintain personal hygiene. I think that if school is being resumed, it is always after the community epidemic is stabilized. And you first have all the office workers coming back to work first, and then the university students, and then the secondary students. And finally, if everything uh, goes well, everything's still stable, there is no major outbreaks after the resumption of work and also the universities and secondary schools, then it comes to the primary schools and kindergartens. And as you said uh, very clearly, you must do preparation work. Say, for example, for the resumption of offices, we actually tell Everybody who uh, go back to office must have your temperature checked. Make sure that you are not running a fever and that you are not having any respiratory symptoms. If you're found to have any fever or any respiratory symptoms uh, on before you enter the office, we have a infection control supervisor in every office. So they measure temperature when you come in, you try to come into office and the same time ask you, hey, do you have any form of respiratory symptoms. If you have it, either fever or respiratory symptoms, you immediately are being asked to go home. And everybody that enter the office must be wearing a mask. And before you enter the office, you must do alcohol hand rub first. And then we you go for lunch or for, for tea, for example. Uh, we don't encourage people to go uh, to uh, tea together. 
but you take a cup of coffee, go back to your own desk and have your own coffee. And similarly for lunch, you face the wall when you take off your mask and then eat your own lunch box. We don't try to share saliva uh, during uh, lunch or share saliva during uh, 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 talking, and that, that is actually dangerous. So anytime when the farm mask is being taken off, there is a danger of you infecting other people or other people infecting you. Uh, so that is a very important lesson. When do people take off your mask? Of course, when you are inside your home. And that's why familial spread is very common. Well, you, when you go to church for prayers, you also take off your mask. And it's also dangerous. You go to have the dinner in food premises or lunch in food premises. Again, you take off your mask. And again, that uh, makes you very vulnerable. So you can see that many of these uh, infection clusters are in the family, in the uh, religious premises, in the food premises, bars and uh, uh, karaoke, etc. So masks taken off during epidemic is always dangerous. Uh, thank you. We have very little time left. Lots of questions coming in. I want to show you this Facebook comment that compares you with Dr. Fauci, the American uh, expert who people are turning to in America, Anthony Fauci, as a great expert. And uh, it's a great chat about East-West cultural differences. Professor uh, Yuan and Dr. Fauci are exemplar public health leaders. So I, I think that's important that people see that there are people who are working so hard, like Professor Yen and others, to make this uh, to, re to prevent and reduce the long-term effects of this. So we have some more questions coming in that we want to bring to you. Uh, we have a question from Cherry who says, my question directs to less privileged parts of the world where not only masks and hand gel are scarce, but even clean water is inaccessible. What advice do you have for those people? Well, uh, life has a lot of limitations. Just try to keep yourself as clean as possible. Uh, we understand that uh, they don't have mask and hand gel, but it is still possible to do social distancing in the un underdeveloped areas. So although you don't have even uh, clean water to clean your hands, but uh, social distancing is possible. Always have hope, always try to maintain a balanced diet, moderate exercise, Always try to maintain adequate circulation of air, which means ventilation by opening windows. Uh, with these, uh, and especially with a lot of hope, I'm sure that some of you must be able to overcome this epidemic. Thank you. Winnie says that her neighbor uh, had had the coronavirus and has come. They've come back. The neighbors have come back to their building. Uh, do they still have some traces of it? How do we know? If some, we meet somebody who had coronavirus or COVID-19, are they? what are the ch chances they're still uh, able to transmit? In general, if the fever completely comes down and that he, they, they are already seven to 10 days after symptom onset, and the doctor has checked that the viral load is very low, most of these people have already neutralizing antibody in the blood. So the chance of them infecting other people is actually quite low. And I don't think that is a cause for worry. But while I say that, I still advise everybody to wear a mask, do good personal hygiene and social distancing, because there is still a slight risk of these people shedding a smaller viral virus, although most of these virus should not be infectious. So low risk, I must say, but maintain all the personal hygiene measures, despite that this uh, these people are already in what we call convalescent stage of the infection. So don't stigmatize people and don't um, try to uh, be too uh, hard on them. I mean, uh, we all can have this infection. And uh, before the uh, vaccines and antiviral uh, prophylaxis and treatment are available, uh, being good citizens is very important. Uh, Professor, I have a comment here from Prashanta who asks about groceries and things you buy in the store and then you put them in the fridge. Uh, is, is, is that a problem when you do that? Do the, does the virus stay on it? You know, he was asking about five to six degrees Celsius or minus 10 Celsius if you put it in the freezer. Uh, talk a little bit about that, please. 
Well, in fact, that uh, we maintain the virus alive by the putting in at, at that temperature. But uh, in general, if those groceries are not being touched or spit upon by other people, generally it's safe because you, most of the time you, you cook it and you wash it first. Remember by washing the grocery with detergent and water, that would destroy the virus already. And of course, after you cook it, everything should be basically fully disinfected. So that is not an area of great concern as long as you wash them with water and detergents and you cook it. Thank you. Uh, we're almost out of time. Yanis, who's watching, says this is such excellent information, he says on Twitter. We're so glad. Uh, Professor uh, uh, Dr. Yen is going to reach behind him. There he goes. And he's going to do a demo of the surgical mask and show us how it can be used. And we have to also remind us the difference between this mask and an N95 mask. So this is just a surgical mask, which is very cheap but very effective in preventing uh, yourself from being sprayed upon by large respiratory droplets in saliva. Now, the, I'm putting it on. I make sure that it cover my chin, cover the side of my face, and make sure I squeeze it here over the bridge of my nose. Now, my surgical mask is fully on. And you can see whenever, when I inspire, the mask go in. When I exhale, the mask expand a bit. So you can see that inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, the mask is really functioning. That's how we make it work. Many people after wearing the mask for a while, the mask start to slide down. And how I keep it well is because I squeeze the bridge of my nose very tightly. And especially when my face is smaller, by squeezing here a bit, the mask now is very tightly fitted on my face. And that is the way to make sure that your mask is working. And what I about remember the, that, this kind well, of? Well, your kind of mask is the N95. Generally, it is very tightly fitted already because you do a fit test. And again, by breathing in and out, you know exactly where the mask is fitting you well. Once you try to inhale, you can actually feel that the mask go in. When you exhale, the mask go a bit out. There should not be a lot of leakage around the side of your mask. Yes. Now, but I must say that wearing N95 mask for a few hours is very, very uh, difficult uh, because uh, you may have some degree of carbon dioxide retention by doing that, especially when you're working in the healthcare settings. And also there are a lot of pressure on the skin and that lead to quite a bit of discomfort to the healthcare workers. So in general, if you are not a healthcare worker, working in a isolation ward with a lot of infected patients, I won't advise an N95 mask. I would only advise you to wear a surgical mask like what I'm wearing. Uh, thank you. And you know, one of the things you've shown us is that you can have a conversation wearing the mask. It's easier with a surgical mask, but you're, I'm able to do it with the N95. I think people can hear me. Nicholas Wong says, thank you and your team for the effort, Professor, and uh, so much great content coming through. So we're almost out of time. I want to give you a chance, Professor, to give us some final thoughts uh, for the moment. And I'm hoping that you will come back and continue to share your wisdom with us. We have 1,700 people around the world right now watching. They'll also be watching the recording. So please share some more of your final thoughts for now. I think everybody must uh, understand that this is a very serious pandemic. It would not be a short battle. It may last for many months. Perhaps in summertime, it may ease a bit, but then in the heat, the extreme heat of summer, it may come back a bit. And then if it goes down again during the autumn and then during winter time, most likely it will come back because uh, our research show that even in the Hubei area, there are Hong Kong people returning from Hubei, around 400 odd people. When we check the antibody, only around four to 5% of these people have antibody, which means a lot of our population, even in those highly endemic area or epidemic area, still do not develop adequate amount of herd immunity. 
And that means that the epidemic is going to last until we have an effective and safe vaccine. Thank you for all your attention. Thank you, Professor. Our guest has been Professor K.Y. Yun, who graduated from the University of Hong Kong in 1981 and heads the Department of Microbiology and has the rare distinction of being a microbiologist, surgeon, and physician. He played a key role in the discovery of the agent causing SARS, the SARS coronavirus, thus leading to measures that were crucial to containing the outbreak of the disease. And he also published the first Lancet paper on the familial cluster of COVID-19 pneumonia, indicating person-to-person -person transmission. Professor, what you said about the N95 mask is so true. Just wearing this and for less than three or four minutes, I can feel pain here, and I can feel it much harder to breathe than a surgical mask. And I feel for all our healthcare workers who have to wear the same mask again and again and again and being exposed to it, it is such a tragic situation. Salutes to the healthcare workers. They are really working hard for us. Uh, thank you. So folks, you've been watching this global conversation around the COVID-19 crisis brought to you by Hong Kong University. We want to thank HKU Med. Please follow at HKU Med. And please continue to ask your questions with Ask HKU Med as the hashtag. My name is Sri Srinivasan. I'm a visiting professor, Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at Stony Brook School of Journalism. And I host a daily COVID-19 call every day discussing aspects of this crisis. Please join me by following me on Twitter at Sri, S-R-E-E. -E, and we'd love to have your thoughts and your questions. Please continue to ask those questions. Thank you very much, Professor. We wish you the very best. And also your team, your students, your researchers, we are counting on you to continue to lead the way. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.